Our next speaker has held a variety of assignments, including Commander, 40th Combat Aviation Brigade, Fresno, California, Commander, Joint Task Force North, U.S. Northcom, Fort Bliss, Texas, and is now the Commanding General of the 40th Infantry Division at Los Alamitos, California. It is my privilege to introduce Major General Lar Yeager. Hey, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Uh, we're getting a slight late, late start to my presentation, but good news, mine is only 25 minutes or so barring questions, so I think we should be able to get back on schedule. A little intimidating, um, the lineup that presented already this morning to come after General Donahoe, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. General Funk, Peter Zehan, um, excellent presentation, and John Antals was, uh, was riveting, so I hope to live up to that standard with mine. Um, so military combat in urban terrain is not new. Um, there's been some very recent examples, such as combat in cities, um, Mosul is a good example, but the character is likely to change in terms of the scale. How prepared are we to conduct multi-domain operations, offensive and defensive, in very large modern cities? The objective being um, to defeat the enemy, but also to um, minimize harm to the local civilian population and preserve as much of the infrastructure as we possibly can. So the dilemma is, how do we save the village without destroying the village? What TTPs can we learn um, and extrapolate from those past battles and past operations? And what do we need to do going forward? Today I'm going to talk about combat in megacities or defense in dense urban terrain, com combat in de um, dense urban environments. Why the 40th Infantry Division is interested in this topic what we've learned from our past operations, and offer some suggestions on how we can increase our readiness to fight and win in these challenging environments. There's currently a tremendous amount of interest in this topic um, within military, among our partners and allies, across academia, and also within Congress as well. In fact, the 2020 NDAA uh, directed a report on lessons learned in Mosul and Raqqa to inform on training, doctrine, and resourcing future operations in densely pop populated environments. It's a problem that first came to our attention um, due to our affiliation with a user PAC when General Brown noted that 21 of the 41 largest cities and seven out of 10 of the largest armies were located in his area of operations and responsibility. Around the same time, General Milley was also talking about the topic. In these last several years, interest has continued to grow. The topic is even more timely now, given Russia is on the doorstep of Kyiv, as we are here today. The world's population is steadily moving into megacities, cities with populations greater than 10 million, and currently there are 37 such cities. When we look at the map on the lower left of the slide here, you see that combat operations in large cities appears to be unavoidable. Our ability to project power will depend on having access to and through many of these cities. And making matters worse, some of these cities are populated with um, civilians that are hostile to our interests. The chart on the upper right hand shows the exponential acceleration of growth. With 3.3 billion of the world's population living in cities out of the 7 billion, and rising urbanization, potential for U.S. land forces to operate in ur urban environments um, will steadily increase. And our adversaries operating in this terrain can blunt our advantages in terms of detection, standoff, and precision firepower. In addition to kinetic, kinetic attacks, we can expect asymmetric attacks, cyber, information warfare, and terrorist actions as well. My division became really interested in this um, topic during Warfighter 20-3. Uh, it was almost exactly two years ago. Um, it was 2020 BC, I like to say before COVID. Um, when we, during that exercise, one of our main objectives was to um, seize a city that contained a port and open the port. Um, we actually, I'm, I'm proud to say we were able to accomplish that objective. And not that it was easy or anything, because it wasn't. Um, but we seized the city, we opened the port, and here's the really unrealistic part of it. We were able to maintain security of that port uh, with one MP company and one scout platoon. This doesn't seem realistic at all to us. Um, so 
that kind of opened our eyes. Um, later that summer, um, we had the George Floyd um, civil disturbances across the country, and the California National Guard activated 10,000 soldiers. So we actually got a call at about um, 7 o'clock on a Saturday night, and by 2 in the morning, we had soldiers on the street. Um, within 48 hours, we had 5,000 soldiers activated for that um, uh, civil unrest um, requirement. And uh, a day later, we had 10,000 soldiers. But when you put a brigade um, in a city the size of LA, which is a mega city um, in that county greater than 10 million residents, it's like a drop in the bucket. And so there definitely were some challenges there. Um, even with COVID having shut down a lot of the economy um, at that time in LA, transportation through the city is difficult. There are issues with sustainment and obviously line of sight communications are a challenge as well. Um, it was somewhat easier for us because we know that terrain. Um, obviously, we speak the languages and, and we know the city pretty well. Um, and generally speaking, um, being that it was a permissive environment, we didn't have too much trouble. The local population was pretty happy to have us there. Um, with that activation lasted for a week. I suspect that had it gone longer than a week, um, sentiment might have turned against us. Um, but it was, it was a good activation and we learned a lot um, about what the challenges would be if we were to operate in a less permissive environment. So, um, so I would say that while um, operations in uh, support of civil authorities are not the same as combat operations, there's definitely some relevant lessons learned that do carry over. And um, definitely, uh, you know, if we're to engage in combat operations, there's a whole next level of things that we're gonna need to keep in mind. Um, but we learned a lot, and we think that that experience uh, makes the 40th Infantry Division um, probably um, better prepared in some ways to operate in urban environments. So um, we've also come to believe that um, just like there are mountain divisions and jungle divisions, that there probably should be at least one division that has specialization in urban combat. And again, we think because of our past experience, our relationships with law enforcement, um, experts in consequence management, um, that we are probably ideally suited for that. Okay, so John Antal um, spoke earlier about um, the Gurno Karabash, um, and he mentioned that he has a presentation on Susha. Um, we're really lucky in California to have um, Colonel John Spencer on our team. Um, he is the chair of the Urban Warfare Studies at the Modern War Institute, and he's now a member of the California National Guard. He is a recognized subject matter expert in urban warfare. I highly recommend reading his papers and listening to his podcasts. Um, this paper that he did uh, just past June, he talks about three lessons learned that I think are important in urban combat. And while the city of Susha is um, a small city, it's only about 4,000 folks there, there are some lessons learned, I think, that are broadly ap applicable to um, uh, mega cities. So the capture of Susha was a major strategic victory for Azerbaijan, and it ultimately decided the outcome of the war. Um, cities have long become um, you know, key strategic objectives. They're um, usually built on key terrain, such as ports, for instance. And they're seats of national power, they contain essential resources, and offer control of important lines of communication. So some would argue that we should simply bypass a city, but as I mentioned, the Warfighter 20-3, the city was our objective, so um, it's often unavoidable. So it's, if it's not an option, then we really must be prepared to operate in those environments. Um, the second point is um, urban combat is not simply an infantry task. So it requires combined arms, and in Susha, uh, air superiority, bombing, long-range precision uh, strikes, unmanned aerial systems, they were all enabling warfighting functions. Um, capturing the city required combined arms capabilities, including special forces, fires, armor, engineers, and infantry as well, um, in both the shaping and decisive operations. It does take infantry units to clear urban terrain, building to building, but to be successful, the division's gonna require mobility equal to or better than our adversaries. We should expect to use armored vehicles and mobile protective firepower as well. Okay, so once you've taken the terrain, what then? Um, you not only have to be able to take the, the terrain, but you also have to be prepared to retain it. In Susha, the Armenian forces left the cliffs surrounding the city unguarded because they assumed them to be unpassable. 
This oversight enabled 400 Special Forces soldiers to infiltrate the city and block the road, um, preventing Armenian reinforcements from getting into the city. So that was a, that was a big error. Um, okay, on the other hand, what we learned in Mosul is a small number of forces can be very difficult to dislodge. So in the Battle of Mosul, it took approximately 100,000 coalition forces months to dislodge what we think was 10 to 20,000 ISIS, most of which were probably not that well trained. So it's, it's much easier to defend a city than it is to, um, to seize it. Now, this is an example on the civilian side, but we've also, if you've been following the news, have been watching what's been going on in Canada, where a few, a um, couple hundred, 300 truckers have basically shut down important lines of communication and crippled a city. So you, you have to really be taking into account the, um, the variables, um, the, what the civilian population can throw your way when you're operating in urban environments as well. Okay, so looking at this problem set in the dot mill PMF um, framework doctrine, um, testing existing doctrine and developing TTPs is really necessary. The TRADOC um, pamphlet um, on the upper hand right side um, is very current. It was published in 2020, and it does a fantastic job of laying out the strategic, tactical, and operational implications of operating in urban terrain. Um, the um, predecessor was a TC 90-1 that was published in 2008, and it is really coin influenced. Talks a lot about um, going building to building, kicking in doors, and clearing rooms. So there's a, there's a real big gap there in the how to operate in this environment. Um, what we hope to do with the 40th Infantry Division is draft something that would draft something that would be like the Gold Book, um, but for urban operations instead. And so far, we've made good progress on that task. Um, last year, we offered our first urban planners course. And what we've done is we've maintained contact with the students from that course who came from different um, areas of expertise. And they've been, we've been basically crowdsourcing um, this SOP. So we've got some pretty good progress on that. But uh, the thing is, we really got to, we have to move past the idea of coin. And we need to look at the lessons learned from previous battles figure out what we can take forward, what's relevant, and throw away what's not relevant so we don't get stuck in the past. So, uh, I don't know if I did that. So, interesting, the um, chart on the lower right-hand side comes out of that old TC, and it does illustrate some of the challenges that we find in the urban environment. So, you know, being here where, you know, tanks are kind of king, right? Um, you can see that the main gun's elevation are not going to reach the upper story, so that's a huge risk. And another example from the civilian um, side of the world, in 2017, there was the sniper that was in Las Vegas. And that one man uh, managed to kill um, 40 folks and wound, uh, I believe it was over, it was like maybe six, what's my number, 60 wounded. No. Anyway, several hundred killed um, and wounded in that, in that event. So, um, yeah, 60 killed, 400 wounded. So anyway, we would like to fill that gap and um, provide the staff officers something practical that they can work with. Something else that we would like to look at is how to best um, fill and employ the civil military operations centers. So you want to find the, the people that have the right skill sets, bring them into that organization, and use them in planning and execution of operations in the urban environment. Um, and the other thing, too, is the, this is always important, but how um, you can best employ your LNOs to get them into the right places so that you can leverage the capabilities that are resident in the cities, um, thus relieving you of some of those tasks as a commander in that environment. So in terms of organization, um, we need to determine what the optimal um, uh, task orgs would be um, in those operations. Um, there are some low density capabilities that are really important, so things like your civil affairs, linguists, um, uh, access to engineers um, is also really important, uh, public affairs, information ops. Um, we're looking at using light divisions for this mission, um, but it's doubtful that light divisions have the mobility and transportation capabilities that are really going to enable success in a large um, city. Um, I'm particularly interested in the application of aviation in cities. Um, uh, when I was deployed to Iraq, uh, we generally flew to about 1,000 feet above the cities. That was because the risk 
Um, the greatest risk we had was with small arms fire. And I would suspect in mega cities that would be the case as well. So how we employ aviation, rotary wing I'm talking about, would probably be more to secure the perimeter of the cities to control access, the lines of communication and prevent reinforcements from coming into the city. Um, we could also look at using um, UAS at higher altitudes to facilitate ISR targeting and potentially to serve as um, retransmission platforms to get after that problem with the line of sight communication. Another capability that um, appears to be really well suited for these operations would be our maneuver enhancement brigades that come with a really nice array of capabilities. The engineers, the MPs, the chemical and EOD and some civil affairs normally are within those formations that appear to be I, I really ideally suited for operations in cities. Okay, um, training, and this is the thing I mentioned, the thing that got it, our interest at first was how unrealistic the training was, the scenario in the warfighter. So we need to make sure that we can incorporate um, some injects at a minimum that would help us as commanders think through some of the problem sets. So I think an easy fix would be to um, simulate um, a large number of um, uh, displaced personnel on the battlefield, for instance. You know, they, they're gonna generate needs for um, support. They're gonna clog up your lines of communication. How do you, how do you deal with those? Uh, maybe even putting um, some enemy in locations that cause targeting dilemmas for us. So for instance, putting um, enemy in the vicinity of a nuclear power plant. You know, what would be the consequences of targeting the enemy there? So um, I think there's some easy things that we can do. Um, the 40th Infantry Division is really excited to be working with a well-known um, wargaming expert. Brian Train is working with us. He's created a thing called the Urban War Chest, which um, is a pretty simple um, and abstract game about large-scale combat operations. Um, two opposing divisions, um, division-level commanders, try to capture and defend objectives on an urban hex map game. And to succeed, you must successfully manage not only your combined arms forces on the battlefield, but the reinforcements and logistics. He's also working on a scalable urban combat Kriegspiel, um, which will be specialized for um, an urban version. And um, it will be division level tactics, scales from battalion level to division, and it's gonna take into account more variables, including civilian populations. And um, it's more complex, it'll take more time for staffs to really master that, but it provides that um, staff training vehicle. Um, so it is really important for us to have some kind of a feedback loop. So as we're trying to think through what tactics we can use, you know, how do we test it? And the, and the simulations piece is, is really, um, really an important aspect. In terms of material, um, it would be really great to know what is, um, coming our way from futures commands, so things like um, smart munitions, robotics, um, ways to get around the problems that we're having with communications, um, both just the line of sight problems and in the subterranean environments. So um, that's something we wanna look at. And then um, how we can leverage artificial intelligence as well. So every city is full of sensors. You know, the, the city of Los Angeles in the surrounding has 10 million sensors, 10 million people posting to social media. You've got cameras on every um, uh, traffic light. You've got um, you know, cameras all over the city. So how do you pull in all that data and process it and use it um, in terms of targeting and, and all of the other um, um, information that you need as a division commander? It's a massive amount of information. So AI could help with that. AI could also really help with targeting and determining second and third order effects of hitting a target. So say you, you take out a power plant, does that power plant provide power to a hospital or orphanage? And if so, when the hospital loses power, does it have um, backup generators and fuel and so forth? Because you really wanna know what the second and third order effects are of your actions. But the city is so interconnected, um, it's such a web, it's really difficult for a staff to do all those calculations. So AI could be really helpful there as well. Okay. All right, um, leadership. So um, the criticality of uh, mission command, and that's been spoken about a couple times today. Again, um, you know, reaching back to our experience in that um, civil disturbance activation. Um, those 10,000 soldiers, we had to make sure that they knew what the commander's intent was. And it was really simple. We told them, protect lives, protect property, and protect the citizens' right to protest peacefully. So pretty, pretty basic instruction. Um, we had several occasions where, um, where protesters 
um, got fairly aggressive with our soldiers, um, and they demanded that the soldiers take a knee with them. Well, you know, it's a tense situation. Um, we had um, a couple of, of our members decide to go ahead and take a knee with those protesters. They're on the ground. They are the best informed. You know what? It turned out that when they did that, it de-escalated the situation. And you could argue that, you know, they should have done, they shouldn't have done it. But at the end of the day, um, they made the best decision they could with the information on hand, and we backed them up when they did that. So uh, mission command is really um, important, the, uh, the value of the strategic um, corporal, uh, for instance. So um, additionally, it's really important for us to recognize, and it's hard to do sometimes because everybody comes to us for answers, but we're not always the best informed. So we really need to be looking for experts from outside the DOD to help inform us on these, um, on these issues and potentially looking for broadening opportunities for our own personnel to go serve with other organizations that might have more experience in this area. With respect to personnel, once we um, train people, um, it would be a good idea if, if we leverage that training. That's where the additional skill identifier would come into um, to play to make sure that we're leveraging that. Um, so, um, let me see what, okay. Right. Um, facilities. Um, I think we can all agree that the current captives um, are not sufficient in scale to replicate uh, megacities. Um, it's a challenge, um, something that we really need to look at. But we do want to leverage the facilities that we have. And it could be a case of just adding um, taller buildings, you know, in some cases. Um, out at Rajesh is a, is a really pretty good um, training facility out there. And we're really happy to have a, a good working relationship with General Taylor out there. So um, we want to leverage that uh, partnership. Um, so the thing is, we don't want to um, suggest that virtual training could take the place of actual live training. So um, we want to leverage both, both options as best we can. There is a pretty good training facility, Mus Muscatatic training facility, um, that has a couple hundred buildings and it's um, spread out over about 1,000 square miles. Um, the limitation there is that they don't normally have the role players, um, so there's an added expense there. In Singapore, they're building um, another facility, which sounds really exciting. Um, it's supposed to open in phases starting in 2023, um, and it has um, 70 mock buildings, including three 12-story blocks, underground facilities and other urban structures, a bus interchange, a subway, and a high-rise interconnected buildings, dense building clusters, and um, so that'll support a wide range of training activities. So I would suggest, if this is possible, since we already do a Cobra Gold exercise regularly with Singapore as um, one of the players in that, if we could incorporate that facility into a future Cobra Gold exercise, I think that would be absolutely phenomenal. All right. OK, so um, as I mentioned, we've done one course already. Um, we're planning to, the, to do the next one, the 10th or the 16th of July, um, down at our headquarters at Los Alamitos. Um, this is just a thumbnail of what the topics are going to be for that course. We're limiting it to um, 50 in person, and that's because we take a um, Black Hawk flight um, out to NTC to tour Rajesh, um, and that also includes an aerial survey of the LA basin just for students to get perspective. But we will be able to offer virtual option for people to attend the rest of the material um, if they would like to do so. Um, I like to say that um, participating in our Urban Combat Planners course is kind of like Hotel California, so you can check in, but you can't ever leave. So we want to keep people as part of the community of in interest and help develop um, the, the, the gray book that we're working on and also keep the progress going wherever we can. So. Um, Hopefully that is something that um, is of interest. We already do have a number of people that we're looking to attend. Um, in this case, the who attends is as important as the content of the course um, because we're expecting people to come with some relevant experience and or uh, some passion, at least, for the topic. Um, and we will, um, for the course, be providing um, a curriculum of pre-reading so people come um, primed um, to, you know, to talk about this. And then there's a culminating training exercise at the end, which, which is an urban war game. So um, pretty cool stuff. Um, that's this summer. Next summer, the 40th Infantry Division is scheduled to deploy in support of Operation Spartan Shield. Uh, we would like to you know, maintain the momentum and do an urban course 
Um, that summer as well, it's obviously going to be challenging um, given the divisions deploying, um, but we're going to see what we can do to, to manage that with the rear detachment. So if you're interested in participating, I know it's tiny, tiny print on the lower right-hand side, um, but if you're interested, that would be the contact information. And um, I know we're trying to get someone back on schedule here, so um, if, if there's not time for questions, you could use that um, email address to um, direct any questions or comments my way or anything that you think is just not, um, this is not the right time or place to bring up. But I'm really interested in hearing um, what you have to think and any suggestions for additional um, things that we can do to advance on this issue. Okay, and so um, there's a quote from um, General Milley there. I think that this is a really complicated topic. It can become almost overwhelming to try to imagine all the different variables that come into play. Um, but I am convinced that when we get everybody together on this, we can make progress and we can come up with tactics and we will be able to prevail and win um, in this environment. The one thing I would ask, because you never come to a presentation without some kind of an ask, right, um, is uh, it, we've been conducting the course out of Hyde, so it cost us $90,000 to do the, the course last year, which is in the big pictures not a lot of money. Um, but if, so I'm not going to start a GoFundMe account or anything, so don't worry about that. But um, if anybody's got a line on funding that's existing right now, so for instance, money um, that we can use lines of accounting to bring speakers in, that sort of thing, or to help fund um, advancing the, the um, war gaming um, projects that we're working on, that would be phenomenal. So that was my spiel. I think I got through it pretty quick. Um, and now I'm available for questions or comments or to be done if you need me to be oh, done. Ma'am, plenty of time. Thank you. All right. So I'll start off with the first question, ma'am. So what are some of the unique or special problems that you have uncovered in the 40th Division that we may not have considered, i.e. Uh, breathing apparatus requirements for subterranean environments if they're fouls, special things in the conventional forces we might not have considered? Yeah, we haven't really um, got into the subterranean environment as much as, as we could. Uh, I think that... Um, so I'm, I'm going to segue into a, a question that I wish you'd rather answer than the one you did ask. But um, subterranean um, and a lot of the characteristics of cities, there, there's advantages and there's disadvantages. So the subterranean environment provides opportunities for us to maneuver unseen, but the same thing is true for our adversaries. Um, and we really will have to overcome the, um, the communications piece in order to successfully operate down there. Thank you, ma'am. Any, que any questions from the, uh, from the auditorium here? All right, another question, ma'am. Could you speak more to, uh, to the training? Uh, you talked about the urban war chest and some of the simulations requirements and then some of the existing cactives like Razish at NTC. H how have you, if, if you have determined how we can effectively train at the small unit level to practice urban operations in megacities considering the difficulty of simulating the environment? Yeah, um, so the, the first course that we held um, we're really lucky. I, mean, I just want to brag on the National Guard here real quick. We have a lot of talent. We have people that bring skill sets by way of uh, other, their other employment or interests. So um, one of our officers, um, Lieutenant Colonel Gygax, his dad, Gary Gygax, is actually the creator of um, Dungeons & Dragons. So um, Colonel Gygax, he you know, set up a war game for us. Um, the idea being that you need somebody to basically be the advocate for the, um, for the local population. Um, so when you're doing the war gaming, so I think this is kind of a simple thing that you can do. You can have the opposing forces, you can have friendly forces, and then you have somebody that's speaking the voice of the, well, I happen to be the, you know, the people of the community. This is how I'm going to react if you do A. So when they did the turns, they made sure to include um, that representative. And I think that um, that will help um, folks think about some of the, um, some of the challenges that they're going to have in the urban environment. Ma'am, can I ask a question, please? Um, with regard to the, the exercises that, that you've run, <clears throat> um, who has simulated the, the red side? And, and are they simulating, a say, a, a Chinese unit, a Russian unit, or is it, is it still sort of coin-focused? Um, so the question about fratricide, um, I, you know, targeting in a city... Um, it is simply not precise enough to prevent um, harm to civilians and our own forces. So it's, it's kind of inevitable. But, um, but we're also talking about combat and large-scale um, combat operations, which is different from COIN. And so the calculus on the risk-benefit for targeting, you know, is, is somewhat different. But, yeah, we, you know, we obviously want to 
prevent that um, are standards for um, prevention of fratricide and harm to civilians, obviously much higher than what I think China and Russia um, you know, would be looking at. Um, so I, I would just hope, I'm not an expert here, but if, uh, for instance, if um, Russia wanted to try to capture Kyiv, for instance, that they wouldn't level it in the process because, you know, what would be the point? I, I, I think my, my, mess, my, my question didn't come through clear. I was just curious, who, when you're simulating these, these games and, or, or your exercises, is the adversary who you're up against a, representing a LISCO adversary, a, a Russian or a Chinese unit, say, or is it, is it still coin-focused? No, it's not coin focused. No, so it, it's, yeah, de it's definitely in the large scale combat operations. It might be the Etropians or you know whatever the pseudo pseudo Russians or um, or Koreans. But no, it, it, exactly. It's um, we're trying to get away from coin. Okay. So um, thank you very much for your for your attention. Appreciate your time. Again, if you have anything for me, I'm I'm on the global. Look forward to hearing any ideas you have, especially if you know how to find money for me. That would be, that would be the most awesome thing ever. So, all right. Thank you, everybody.